Welcome back, y'all. In this video, I'll be synthesizing diethyl 25 dienolino terephthalate from DES or diethyl succinyl succinate and aniline, using a small amount of hydrochloric acid as a catalyst and toluene as a solvent. The procedure I'm using is a modified version of one in a patent. Here's a page from it. Read it if you want. This is the patent number. Look it up on Google Patents if you want to. It uses a high boiling solvent called Daltherm A, a eutectic mixture of biphenyl and diphenyl ether, and I don't have that. Because I use a Dean Stark apparatus adding the calculated equivalent of hydrochloric acid to the amount of aniline I use is fine, as the aniline hydrochloride is formed in situ, and the slight amount of water introduced is removed, as well as the water formed during the reaction anyway. The product that's formed first in the reaction is diethyl 25 dienolino 36 dihydro terephthalate, a white crystalline solid, but it's readily oxidized and or dehydrogenated by air to the terephthalate, a vividly red crystalline solid. It's actually orangish red. In the patent, the reaction is conducted under nitrogen to prevent this oxidation, but I don't have a nitrogen cylinder. The product I end up with can also be cyclized directly to quinacridone easily. In the patent, it's cyclized first, then dehydrogenated or oxidized to quinacridone. I decided to skip showing me weighing all the reagents out and putting them in the flask. I used 150 microliters or 0.15 milliliters of 10 molar hydrochloric acid, not 115 as I am kind of clumsy and according to the patent, that small additional amount makes no difference. The solubility of aniline hydrochloride in the reaction mixture is what makes it effective. More won't help or hinder it. I'm also not confident that my hardware store hydrochloric acid is still 10 molar, so I used a little more just in case. I ended up refluxing the mixture with the Dean Stark trap for about 6 hours. The patent recommends 3 hours. And I probably could have stopped after three hours, but I wanted to be sure no more water produced was coming over. After this, I waited for the solution to cool to about 60 degrees and added a very small amount of sodium carbonate dissolved in water to neutralize the acid. Here's the amounts. After standing overnight, there's a precipitate and I filter it, washing with enough toluene to dissolve as much as possible of the precipitate, leaving any insoluble impurities on the filter. Plus what looks like a little of the product, but I didn't think it was worth recovering if it didn't dissolve in all the toluene I washed it with. I transferred the filtrate to a separatory funnel, removed the bottom water layer, and drained the rest into an RBF for a distillation. If you didn't know, the principle of steam distillation applies to other solvents because it's based on the sum of partial pressures at elevated temperatures. Toluene boils at about 111 degrees, but it's a little lower where I am due to the elevation, and aniline boils at about 175 degrees where I am. So aniline has an appreciable vapor pressure at the temperature that toluene boils, so some of it comes over with the toluene, just like it did with water in my previous video, except aniline is miscible with toluene, so a homogeneous solution results. I couldn't find any information on a toluene aniline azeotrope, I did find some on a toluene pyridine one, but that's not aniline. So anyway, that's the line of reasoning I'm choosing to follow. It's important to separate the water before distillation because the condensation reaction that just occurred can be reversed at elevated temperatures in the presence of water. Because the central ring of the product was readily oxidized or dehydrogenated, I don't actually know for sure if the reverse reaction could occur as the stability of the aromatic ring might prevent or minimize it. Either way, I chose not to straight up distill off the toluene and then the aniline because the patent does this under an um, about 25 millimeters of mercury vacuum, so the temperature doesn't exceed 140 degrees. I'm not doing a vacuum distillation, my vacuum pump kind of sucks. Yes, literally and figuratively, so I had to get creative. And the toluene analog of a steam distillation was the best thing I could come up with. After that, while still hot, I transferred it to a small beaker, washed the distillation flask out with some toluene, waited for it to cool, and filtered it. I washed the filter cake with denatured alcohol. Here's the first crop of crystals. I boiled down the filtrate, waited for it to cool, added alcohol to the solution, and filtered off the second crop of crystals. 
Then I transferred the first crop to this petri dish and melted it on my hot plate to remove any traces of solvent and ended up with this very cool crystal formation. I did the same thing with a second crop of crystals in the small beaker. Here's that. Here's both crops of crystals, their weights, their melting points, and the total calculated yield. I'm happy with it. I don't know if there's anything that I'd do differently if I did it again. Maybe shortening the reflux time, but that's pretty much it. I added sulfuric acid and some water to the toluene distillate to neutralize the aniline and try to recover it as aniline sulfate. So far, I've gotten 34.74 grams, but I'm currently working on recovering more, as well as hopefully some more of the terephthalate. And I will edit the description to reflect that. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, like, comment, and or subscribe. It really helps me out. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. And I will see you in the next video.